Good morning. Welcome to Central Valley. Welcome to those of you who are catching us on YouTube. Glad to have all of you present today. It's been a great week. Awesome weather. I, I like the fall, although I was having a conversation with a family before the 8 o'clock service, and they were reminding me it's that time of year when we need to change the batteries on our smoke alarms. So uh, you might be thinking about that before they start chirping in the night. Uh, but it is fall, and uh, I just love this time of year. Please take your bulletin out and take a look at that. There are a number of things I've been asked to just remind us of today, and so I want to make sure I've taken the time to do that. If you're uh, one of our guests today and you've never filled out a connection card for me, there's a tear-off piece that uh, you can fill out for me. You can hand it to me after church today, or you can drop it in one of the wooden boxes at the end of the aisle where we put our tithes and offerings and our decision forms and things like that. So take some time, if you would, to fill that out. I do want you to know there is not a prayer meeting today at 5 o'clock, as we normally do, because I'll be meeting at that time with our Sunday morning Bible study leaders. So if you're one of those, I hope to see you this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Uh, men, we have our breakfast coming up this Saturday. So if you're going to be a part of men's breakfast this week, you will need to go out there and sign up at the Connections counter so we know how much food we need uh, for our Saturday event. So that's at 8 o'clock this particular Saturday. And one of the things that, that I want to try to do uh, for the men who can stay a few minutes after the breakfast concludes is we're going to be moving some furnishings out into the new building. So men, uh, if you've signed up and can stay a little while after it, I would sure appreciate it because uh, we're going to be having our uh, open house here pretty soon with the new building. We're excited about that. I know Disciple Now weekend occurred out there, and they enjoyed uh, the new facility, and so we're excited about that. So breakfast next Saturday. And, uh, for those of you who are in-house today, and those of you who are at home today, you'll just have to know that this is that time of year when we think about Operation Christmas Child, and we pack our shoe boxes, and then we collect them, and they go all over the world. As you came in today, you saw that display in the foyer. And so I want to remind you, it's that time of year. I always enjoy getting to be a part of that. You have an insert in the bulletin. And uh, be sure you take some time to know how to do it. If you've never done it before, uh, the things that you need to know are on the back of that insert. And just know as you're preparing those shoe boxes, they'll need to be returned no later than November the 12th. And uh, we tend to always have a few that show up after they've all left, okay? And so then we're like, okay, now, now what are we going to do? So be sure if you take part in it, have them here that morning or before so they can be picked up and uh, then sent off where they're going to go. You also have the opportunity to help our children in our Awana program because they're devoting a night on November the 8th for packing shoe boxes. So our children's pastor is going to have some kind of display out there, maybe starting next Sunday, where you can bring some of the supplies that are talked about on the insert and donate them so you're helping the kids pack their shoe boxes. So that will also be happening. And if you're like our house, we like to do more than one of the boxes. So uh, when you leave today, you're welcome to pick up a box. I mean, if they're all gone today, I'll have more empty boxes out next week. So uh, we have plenty, and we want to uh, make as many as we can because of the blessing they are all around the world. Women, uh, game night is coming up, and I uh, looked out there. There's about three pages of sign-up already. Uh, here's the information about women's game night, and if, you're, uh, you know, if you want to take part in that, you need to get signed up. There's a reason for that because of all the things that happen on women's game night. We completely change this room be tables and chairs, and we have to know just exactly how many of those we're going to need to have out, and that depends on sign-up. So, ladies, you've been faithful so far, and if you're intending to come and haven't yet added your name out there, be sure that you do that. We just finished up our disaster relief training yesterday, and Joe and Dolores, who lead that ministry, just want to say thank you to the church uh, for taking part in that. They had a good number of people that went through training, and some of those people are praying about and planning to go minister in Hawaii. Now, I probably would call that suffering for Jesus, right? So, uh, but no, they're going to be over there. And you remember what happened with the fires there in Hawaii, and it's the devastation's unimaginable. But uh, there are those who've received the training. 
that are planning to go. And so let me just say, if you want to learn more about how to be a part of our disaster relief ministry, Joe and Dolores are sitting at the back in front of the nursing mom's room. The other things uh, you can read for yourself, we're just looking forward to a day of worship with our praise team. And let me just say thank you ahead of, of the day for that. We, we appreciate you so much. Let me lead us in a word of prayer as we're getting started today. Father, as we bow our heads in this place, our hearts are still uh, tender as we think about what's going on in our world today. We do want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem today, for what's going on there in Israel and Gaza. We ask God that there could be a cessation of hostilities there so that there would be no further loss of life. That's uh, so very, very troubling. But God, would you uh, rise up and be the defender of those that uh, you care for there? God, we thank you that we can worship here today and not be concerned about the things that uh, others may be concerned about. But that doesn't mean, Lord, that we have uh, not realized that even in our own land, we have suffered and will because of our faith. And so I pray, God, that you would help us to not take for granted what we get to do here today or at home today, that we could truly uh, turn our attention toward you and your plans for our life and by faith choose to do that. So God, bless the services here today, uh, even the ones that follow this afternoon. Uh, in other languages, God, and wherever the gospel is going forth today, Lord, we would ask that you bless that, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Would you stand? My name is Kristen. I have up here Noemi and Brandon, Lane and Aaron. We are so excited to be with you this morning. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, the Lord of hosts is with us. Isaiah 43, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. Fear not, for I am with you.
speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name, cause it's all that I can do. In desperation, I seek heaven. Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Every promise is faithful to give. I speak the name no grave could ever hold. He is greater, he is stronger, he is the God of us I pray for your healing. Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee. In Jesus' name, I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray that it calls over your life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray that it calls over your life in Jesus' name. Waiting here for you Waiting here for you You're the Lord of all creation Still you know my heart The author of salvation Love just from the start. 
to hear ourselves sing, not to perform, not to impress anyone, not for the people around us, we sing to you. You are the audience, Jesus. We sing to you to love you and to praise you and to give you center stage in our hearts and our thoughts. And Lord, even in our difficulties, in the tension of waiting. We say you are still Lord and we trust you. And you have always been faithful to your promises and you will be faithful now. So take our eyes off our circumstances, our battles, the people around us and fix our eyes on you lifted high Increase our faith in you and do your wonders. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. 
Amen. Thank you, praise team. If you would, go ahead and be locating in your Bibles the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. If you're new and you're not aware, we have been involved in a study of the life of David this year as we've worked our way through the book of 1 Samuel. So here's the question for the day. How many of you lost control of your emotions since last Sunday? Now, don't answer that question out loud, all right? Because the truth of the matter is we probably all have, even if it was just for a moment, or even if you uh, and I were the only ones who knew what was going on inside our heart, I think many of us would say, yeah, I had, I had a moment this last week. So with that in mind, I believe that today's message has value for us. I believe there's something that we need to be, at least be reminded of, if not learning for the first time from the life of David in the account that we're going to be looking at today. So if you would, go ahead and find chapter 25. Now, there's a, a lot of scripture we're going to be looking at today, and so I'm not going to invite you to stand with me as we typically do as we honor the Word of God, but we're going to be doing that in our heart, right, today as we look at it. Now, this particular chapter begins with David finding out about a rich man who is shearing his flocks down in, in uh, the city uh, that's listed there. I went blank. Carmel. He's down there in Carmel. The scripture says he has 3,000 uh, herd of sheep. Uh, he's got a thousand goats, so he's got a, a lot of animals that he's taking care of on that day. And notice some other things it says in these first verses. It gives us his name. This rich man is named Nabal, and he is kind of described for us. He's described to us as a, a wicked man with an evil heart, a foolish individual. In fact, that's exactly what the name Nabal means. It means fool. And it says that he is married, and his wife's name is Abigail. She is described as being very intelligent and beautiful. Quite a catch. So that's the couple. Now David hears about Nabal, that he's shearing. And so David sends a delegation to go and ask a favor. Pick up with me reading there in verse 5. David sent ten young men. And David said to the young men, go up to Carmel. Visit Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say, have a long life. Peace be to you and peace be to your house and peace be to all that you have. Now let me just interject for a moment and let you know that that's a very traditional Hebrew greeting. In fact, uh, you'll notice that there is a word repeated several times in the greeting. What is the word? It's peace. Now, how many of you know the Hebrew word that means peace? Let me just see your hands. Yeah, I, I heard someone say it, shalom. And that's the word for peace. So uh, in this greeting, David sends the young man to offer his peace to Nabal. Notice verse 7. As they continue, they say, Now I have heard that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we've not insulted them, nor have they missed anything all the days they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. In other words, David is saying, look, check it out, and you'll find out that everything that I'm saying to you is true. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a festive day. Now, you need to know that whenever someone was, you know, bringing in their flock in, for the time of shearing, or whenever it's harvest time and they're bringing in the crop, this is a festive time. It's a time of celebration, right? And there, it's also a time of generosity as people share their material wealth and resources with others. And so I think that's probably some of the motivation that David has for sending the delegation at this particular time. However, I also want to remind you that David is probably feeling the weight of responsibility for trying to figure out how to take care of 600 men that have joined up with him. They follow him there in the wilderness. And, you know, how am I going to find time to take care of you when we're always spending all of our time running from Saul, right? Or engaged in battle. So we have to depend on the help that others can give. So he makes his request. Please give whatever you find at hand to your servants and to your son David. 
You know, whatever you can afford to share with us, that'd be great. Notice Nabal's response. This is in verse 10. Nabal answered David's servants like this. Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are each breaking away from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men whose origin I do not know? Now, you have to understand this was an insult to David. He didn't like what he heard. And as you read farther into the chapter, you're going to find out that in David's emotional response that he, you know, pulls out 400 of the 600 men and sets off down to Carmel to even the score, to set the matter straight. So that's what's going on. Now, fortunately, one of the young servants of Nabal, who was there when David's young men came with their request, went and found Nabal's wife. What was her name again? Abigail went and found Abigail and brought this message. This is in verse 14. Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we were not insulted, nor did we miss anything as long as we went about with them while we were in the fields. Notice what the young man says. He says, they were a wall. To us, In other words, they're, they were like a protective wall around us both by night and by day all the time that we were tending the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what you should do. Abigail, listen, think about what you should do for evil is plotted against our master and against all of his household. And then the young servant kind of throws this in. And you know, nobody can talk to your husband about things like this. I mean, he, he won't listen to anybody. This, he's worthless. And so Abigail, notice what she does. She hurries and she takes 200 loaves of bread. She takes wine and sheep and, and roasted grain and, and clusters of raisins and cakes of figs. She loads them on donkeys and she heads out there to try and head off David to prevent what she believes is about to happen. And when she gets out there and she sees David coming, it says in the scripture, this is in uh, verse 20, I think, that she got down off of her donkey and she ends up falling down before David and says something that David did not expect to hear from her out of her own mouth. He didn't expect, this is in verse 24. She said, on me alone, my Lord, place all the blame. In other words, this is my fault. Now imagine that. You already know what kind of husband she has. But just imagine, here is Abigail. She is claiming to take full responsibility for what has happened, for what her husband has determined, even though she knew nothing about what her husband had said. She wasn't even there when the servants came to make the request, but she is saying, David, I'm the one to blame. I'm responsible for this. Please listen to me. Oh, and by the way, she says, don't listen to my worthless husband. And even though David probably uh, agreed with her, I think it's what she's about to say that's going to make all the difference in this situation. So if you would then skip on down to verse 26. Abigail says, therefore, my Lord, that's how she referred to David, as the Lord, capital L, lives, and your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be like my husband. Now let this gift, which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, be given to the young men who accompany my Lord. In other words, I'm the one that's responsible. She says in the very next verse, please forgive me. This is my fault. Please accept this gift. And if you skip ahead to verse 35, you'll see what happens. In verse 35, David received the gift. He received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, Go up in peace. I have listened to you and granted your request. Now, I'm sure every one of us, including those of you who are listening at home, would agree 
that this situation could have ended in tragedy if it hadn't been for the quick thinking and actions of a woman by the name of Abigail. So what can we learn today about how to handle our emotions? Well, before we answer that question, let's take a time out to pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, as we look back at this moment in David's life, we can all understand how it happened. There have been times when people have wounded and hurt us and said, you know, cruel things to us, and and we reacted in anger. So, God, I'm praying today that you would help us to learn how to guard our heart against angry decisions. Help us learn how to get the best out of our emotions, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we get to the message for today, let me just point out a few things that we also find in the chapter that would be important for you and me to to keep in mind. First of all, decisions made in anger can be disastrous. I mean, we probably know that from experience, right? They can be disastrous. Now, Abigail, she, she goes out of her way to make this clear to David. In fact, in no uncertain terms, she helps him to understand that if he carried out his intended plan, he would be guilty of taking life without just cause. And that's in verse 31. If you do this, you will have no just reason for doing what you're thinking about doing. Now, what was his plan? You'll find it in 1 Samuel 25, verse 22, where it tells us exactly what David intended to do. And if you look at the text, it's pretty obvious. David has determined that he's going to go in there and he's going to slaughter every last standing man alive. He's just going to kill him. He's going to wipe him out because of what what has happened. He's going to go in there. He's going to kill them all. And for what reason? Because Nabal refused to share food? I don't think so. I think the reason he's thinking about this is because his ego has been wounded. His pride has been wounded. After all, look back and think again about what Nabal said. Remember? He said, who's David? And who is the son of Jesse. I think he had an attitude when he was saying, and it's almost like he's saying, who does he think he is to come in here and ask me to give what is mine to him? And I don't even know who these people are. Well, I'm sure he knew about David. Who is David? That's what he was thinking about doing. And even though um, He had those kinds of thoughts and feelings. I need to remind you, those are not reasons that give us permission to take someone's life. In fact, look up this verse of Scripture, Proverbs 14, verse 12. Proverbs 14, verse 12. In fact, the thought in this verse is repeated later. Proverbs 14, verse 12, it says, There is a way... That seems right to a man. In other words, here's David. He's upset. He's frustrated. His ego's wounded. He's hurt. And what feels right to him right now is to get even. But Proverbs 14, 12 reminds us that there is a way that may seem right. There's a way that may feel right. But its end is the way of death. This reminds me that just because something seems right or something feels right, it could be completely wrong. And so you and I need to remember something, that we should never trust the decisions that we are thinking about making that grow out of anger. Never trust them because those kinds of feelings cannot accomplish the will of God. And by the way, God wants the best for you, and he wants the best for those that we interact with, right? So be careful about decisions you make We make in anger, right? Because it can be disastrous. And I'm the first one to tell you, I've seen how it works. Here's another thought I had from this chapter. Never return evil for evil. Now, this ties today's sermon to last week. Because last week, that was one of the things that we started talking about. And we looked at a passage in Romans chapter 12. You'll uh, remember probably if you were here, but turn back and look again. Romans chapter 12, and by the way, make the correction on your listening guide. It's verse 19, not verse 29. So Romans chapter 12, verse 19. The scripture says, Never return evil for evil to anyone, 
even if they're just like Nabal, right? Never return evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Now, raise your hand if you know who I'm talking about. Have you ever heard of the Hatfields and McCoys? Yeah, I, I, I was kind of wondering today if any of the young people would, would know about them because I don't know if they talk about them much anymore. The Hatfields and the McCoys. They were two families that lived back in the 19th century. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was trying to teach our young people how to understand that, you know. When you hear the word 19th century, you're thinking 1900. No, it's the 1800s, right? Because zero to 99 is the first century, right? So back in the 19th century, would put these two families in what years? The 1800s. And uh, these two families, um, the Hatfields lived in West Virginia, and the McCoys lived in Kentucky, and they really were only separated by a tributary that came off of a river whose name I can't remember anymore. So, you know, they live within sight of each other. And history tells us that when Asa McCoy came back from fighting in the Civil War, that he was murdered. And guess who the McCoys blamed for it? The Hatfields. Because you see, there's already bad blood between the two families. And so the uh, McCoys blame the Hatfields for taking the life of of Asa, and thus begins generations of suffering and anguish that each side inflicted upon the other, all because of what they believed had happened, which later was proven to be false, by the way. That means that this feud that's written about in history that many of us know about to this very day, this feud didn't have to happen. It shouldn't have happened because it was based on a falsehood. And as I was thinking about this, ch this uh, chapter in David's life, it just seemed to me that David comes pretty close to writing the same kind of story. Because if he had gone in there and done what he intended to do and killed every man standing, um, you know, that was a part of this family and the servants and all of that, then every woman, every, every mother, every child would have hated the future king of Israel and wanted to get revenge against him. Fortunately, David didn't make that choice to return evil for evil. Instead, he returned good for evil, which, by the way, is the only way to overcome evil, right? What did it say at the end of Romans chapter 12? It said, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. All right. Here's another thought. The value of a clear conscience now, remember the last time that you said something you wish you hadn't or you did something you wish you could undo? How did you feel about that? Well, when I'm thinking back to the last time I did it, I didn't feel so good. My conscience was bothering me. In fact, my conscience wouldn't leave me alone until I did something about it. But when we think about all the things that may be going on in our minds today, you need to understand something. We can't always do something about it, right? We can't always change what has already been set in motion. We can't always make right what was done in the wrong way. We can't always do that. And so when you think about this, you know, this is exactly what Abigail's trying to prevent something that would never be able to be undone. And so, as David listens to her appeal, which I think she did in a very godly way, when he listens to her appeal, he recognizes that he can't carry this out with, and still you know, look, look at himself in the mirror. He knows he's going to have trouble just thinking about how to, to, to you know, live after doing something like this. And so he turns away from his anger and accepts the gift. And by the way, he, in doing so, he kept a clear conscience, which in my opinion is a great gift, a great gift to have because it, it makes a difference in the way you and I experience life because if we keep a clear conscience, it keeps us away from regrets and ulcers and enemies. I hope today that you have a clear conscience. I hope that you'll have one tomorrow 
because you and I have made the choice to love God and put the life and needs of other people ahead of our own, which is exactly what Abigail was doing on the day when she met David in the wilderness and got down off her her donkey and said, this is all my fault. By the way, take a look at this verse of Scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. This is Paul's letter to Timothy, and you may recall that Paul and Timothy have a very unique relationship. Paul is the one who, who helped bring the gospel to this family, and Paul thinks of, of Timothy like his own child, not physically but spiritually. And so in this unique relationship that they have, and by the way, we can have the same kind of relationships with people that we're pouring our life into This is what Paul said. He said, the goal of our instruction. In other words, the whole reason why I pour into you, Timothy, and why you and I pour into the the people that we try to shepherd, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a what? A good conscience and a sincere faith. And those things are possible when we make God's will the supreme goal of our life. So what is it that we can learn today about dealing with anger when we look back here at 1 Samuel chapter 25? Well, here's the first thing I want you to know. Listen. It's like taking a time out in the middle of your emotional response because it helps to ensure that you and I are going to give our best to the other person. For example, Let's say someone's offended you and everything inside of you wants to get even, wants to, you know, uh, respond in a, in a negative way. Well, when that happens, that's time to call time out. It's time to do some thinking before you engage whatever part of your body wants to respond to what has just happened to you. In fact, in the Bible... In James chapter 1, verse 19, there's something I want you to listen to. Something I want you to see. And by the way, I'm only going to start the verse. We'll finish it here in just a few moments. But in James chapter 1, verse 19, the scripture says, this goes along with this first point, be quick to, what's the word? Be quick to hear. Be, be quick to listen. This is the first speed limit sign, by the way, on the road to self-control. Be quick to hear. In other words, make a decision to listen for understanding. And if you and I think about it, when David sees her coming with her servants, you know, he could have just brushed her aside and done what he wanted to do, but instead he stopped to listen to what she had to say. In fact, she said, this is my fault. Please listen to what I have to say. He stopped to listen. So he has had some time to think. When my wife and I were raising our girls, uh, we did everything we could to try to help them understand that whenever they disobeyed or failed to love each other like we thought they should, that they weren't just letting mom and dad down, they were letting God down. And you know what we discovered as we were raising our girls? I found out that God is a better motivator for their behavior than I am. And so we were always working to try to make sure that they understood you are responsible to God for the things you think and say and do. You're responsible to God. David listened. He took time to think. In fact, he took time to rethink what he was about to do, and he realized that he would have to answer to God for that. Now, why? what makes me say that? I think that was on his mind. I'll tell you what makes me say that. It's because when you take a careful look at what Abigail says to him, and so if you go back to your chapter in the Bible and uh, start at verse 26, you go down through verse 31. If you look at all the things that she said as she made her appeal, you will note with me that she refers to and mentions the name of the Lord no less than six times. Almost as if Abigail is trying to give a very subtle reminder to a God-fearing man of what really is at stake here today. And by the way, all of us need to keep this in mind. Because in Romans chapter 14 and verse 12, the Bible says, 
And this is one of those verses to remember. In fact, it's, it says it twice in that chapter. But in Romans 14, verse 12, it says, So then, each one of us will give an account of ourselves to God. And I can think of no better reason than to not retaliate and give someone what we think they deserve than knowing in our heart and mind that we're going to have to stand before God someday and own up to that. We take time to listen so we can take time to think. And only then are we ready to act. And by the way, I think you'd agree with me that the order of these words is kind of important, right? And in fact, let me add a word, okay? Let me give you four words. Stop, listen, think, act. Unfortunately, you and I like to turn it around the other way, right? We tend to act before we think, and we tend to think without listening, and we end up doing things that we regret, I'm not surprised at all then that when we look at the scriptures and when we think about the verse that I want you to take away with you today in James chapter 1 verses 19 and 20 that the Bible says this, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God or the will of God. Be quick to hear, listen. Be slow to speak, think. And then make sure that your response is not one of anger. Now, friends, when I consider all of that, I realize how important this simple lesson is. Because if other people are going to get the best out of me, then when I think about how it works for me, here's, here's kind of what happens sometimes when, when my pride has been wounded or my, my ego is upset by something that someone has said about me. I stop. Now, by the way, I don't mean to paint a picture of me being a perfect guy because I don't always do this, right? But most of the time, I stop. And I think to myself, does that person really know me? Or does that person even know the Lord? And if the answer is no to those questions, then I just simply chalk it up as an attack from the adversary. And I choose then to lash out at him and not the person in front of me. Because remember what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6? This is, you know, one of the most important chapters in the New Testament. So I hope you know what it says. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And by the way, there's a lot of ladies that know this verse here because of a study you've been going through. It says, our struggle, our battle, our problem is not against flesh and blood. But it says that it's against rulers and powers and wicked forces of darkness and spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, it says, put on the what? The full armor of God that you'll be able to resist in the evil day. And after you've done everything, you'll be able to stand firm in your faith. And so you and I need to remember when we're tempted to become angry and lash out at another person that the real battle is not with that person. It's with the adversary who wants to jump into our lives and get us to do something that we'll regret later. Something that may not ever be able to be undone. So the next time someone, you know, wounds my eagle, someone offends me, someone threatens my personal security, I'm going to be thinking in my mind again about Samuel, uh, uh, David in the book of Samuel, and I'm also going to be thinking about the speed limits of self-control, and I'm going to stop to listen and to think before I act, and only then can I be sure I've accomplished the will of God. Friends, this is another lesson from David I'm sure we can all use. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Lord, I'm just speaking for myself at the moment. I have been guilty too many times of acting before I think and thinking before I listen, letting my wounded ego drive my very decisions. 
I thank you that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he took care of all of those sins. But I pray that I would never get to a place where I just kind of ignore what I've done and just kind of let it go. But I pray that you help me to be able to acknowledge my own personal responsibility for those actions and thoughts. And God, then as I move to a place of agreement with you about my behavior, then I pray that you would help me to not only experience um, the promise of your forgiveness, but the power of your spirit to make better decisions next time. And God, if there's a way I can make right what's been done wrong, then I pray that you show me how to do that. And so God, help us all to learn how to control our emotions so that one and all, and that includes you, oh God, will get the best from each one of us. And this thing we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing, Change My Heart. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. was standing here in the last service and thinking about our decision time and it it occurred to me that when I act before I think and I think before I listen it's because I'm a little bit too self-focused when we respond in anger for you know the the little things that go on in our lives it, it tells us a lot about who we're more concerned about right? I'm more concerned about me than I am you. And so as we bow our heads right now, I think the first place maybe for us today is just to confess our selfishness. To ask God to re, you know, work our heart and mind so that our focus is on Him and His desire and His plan, not only for our life, but for others. Because trust me when I say this, it won't be long before someone offends you. It won't be long before your ego gets wounded. It won't be long before you're thinking, I'd like to get even for what happened to me today. But just remember, it's a very self-centered attitude that brings about the kind of negative response that perpetuates these kinds of problems. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence here today, I confess that I've been angry too many times. I have decided to respond with the same kind of attitude that I just got from someone else. And God, I thank you. Thank you for forgiving that. But I pray, God, for, my, uh, for all of us today, not just myself, but I pray that you would help us to all learn how to stop and listen and think before we act. I pray that in doing so that you would keep us away from the kind of things that come along with a guilty conscience and arrogant attitudes and hateful speech and all the things that sometimes come out of us. God, help us to be a people who live in such a way that others can say, you know what, that person's a Christian. Because the things I see and hear from them are the kind of things that I would hear and see in the life of Jesus. So God, I pray, help us not to return evil for evil. Help us to be ready to 
call a timeout so that we can gain control of our emotions, not in our own power and strength, but in the power that you provide through the indwelling presence of your spirit, whose own fruit is evident in our life in the love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control that we can exhibit when we're walking step by step with you. So God, change whatever part of our heart needs to be adjusted today so that we can be a people who bring peace to others and in every relationship that we're a part of. God, that's our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me just say today that if uh, there's something about the message that that you want to talk about, be sure you uh, let us know that you'd like to spend some time with that. I'm praying for you, and I'm praying as we continue to study David's life that we'll carry every lesson with us uh, in our day-to-day life. We have another song that we're about to do before we end the service, but let me just say today that uh, she's going to be ending the service with a song. When she's done, you're dismissed, but be sure you greet someone before you leave today. Oh, God of grace, how often have I grieved Thee? How seldom have I sung Thy praise? Little do I know how much I need Thee And time again I turn away For how my heart is hard and unbelieving For all I've done and left undone Your love is not reluctant to receive me soul draws back the love says come he will not cast you out he will not cast you out whoever enters in will forever dwell with him draw near faint heart draw near love still bids you welcome Father, when I sin against my neighbor, I turn away your very son, who died to call us friends when we were strangers, and says to every sinner, come. He will not cast you out, he will not cast you out. Whoever enters in will forever dwell with him. Draw near, faint heart, draw near. Love still bears you welcome here. O oh Lord of light, you call us out of darkness to turn aside from sin and prodigals we come to you for pardon of a father take us in he will not cast you out he will not cast you out whoever enters in will forever dwell with him oh he will not cast you out he will not cast you out in, will forever dwell with him. Draw near, faint heart, draw near. Love still bears you welcome here. Draw near, faint heart, draw near. Love still bears you welcome here. You're dismissed.